Morphosaurus is a repository that's uh, a bit newer than I think uh, many of those that have been discussed so far today. So we're at sort of an earlier stage. And let's see. Yeah, let's advance the slide here. There. I'm going to start by introducing the resource, uh, talk a little bit about the impact it's had so far, and then talk about um, what we envision as a, an approach to sustainability for our long-term operations. So the primary goal of MorphoSource is to support transparency, reproducibility, and impact of research based on physical aspects of curated specimens. So what you might imagine finding in a natural history museum. And so more specifically, what is MorphoSource? It's a digital repository service where researchers, museum curators, and the general public can find access via either downloads or a web viewer with some measurement and annotation functions, contribute via uploads, and manage collections of digital media representing physical objects of academic or scholarly interest, primarily uh, biological objects and with an emphasis on, on 3D representations, three-dimensional. And specifically, the scope then is limited to representational data and its derivatives, so data collected by sensors, um, and this therefore mainly excludes things like document types of data or born digital uh, data. And we have broad support for 3D data resources. Uh, this is a bit probably technical for this crowd, but everything uh, from uh, data formats for CT scans to, uh, to structured light scanners and photogrammetry models. So in the basics here, uh, the, the platform was founded in 2013 at uh, Duke University uh, as a site for uh, free download and contribution of data. Now, I, I haven't said open download because that is sort of one difference between uh, this site and others. Uh, we aren't strictly a, a CC0 uh, fully open uh, site, and that is in order to satisfy uh, the requirements of some of the key stakeholders in this space, uh, those being uh, museum collections. Uh, we only support uh, open data formats, no proprietary formats and have been involved in discussions developing best practices for uh, sharing these data in a preservable way. Uh, we've uh, had broad support uh, from, uh, from institutions and, uh, and NSF, and we've had uh, increasingly broad adoption uh, by museums as well as uh, the re uh, research community. And, um, in terms of responding to uh, the changes of our community, uh, we've been working on a, a refactor and redesign for the last several years that was, re, that was launched uh, about a year ago. And at this point, uh, the repository uh, has about a, a 154,000 uh, data sets uh, representing 50,000 uh, physical objects uh, that uh, come from about 1,000 different organizations, these being uh, that, that is, specimens are housed uh, from a thousand different museums. Um, and our user community is small by the standards of some of these other resources, uh, but I think large for the discipline we represent. We've got about 15,000 registered users and 1,600 contributors. And the technical stack is, um, is an open, actively developed uh, stack uh, using community-driven components. Uh, and there are different components here. Uh, the front end being a Hyrax uh, repository, um, it being underlain by a, a secure digital preservation layer uh, using solar for fast and scalable indexing. And then another important part is our uh, met approach, uh, and this is, this is part of discoverability, um, is our approach to uh, creating previews um, of, of the data using open uh, components like the universal viewer using uh, uh, image uh, sharing protocols according to IIIF and using derivative and characterization protocols uh, through Blender. So in terms of impact, um, 
we have seen uh, increasing use rate as um, essentially the uh, community of users has manifested. I mean, th this is essentially the only repository uh, of its kind. Uh, we've had some uh, some of our biggest spikes during uh, the onset of COVID and um, after we launched the, the refactored platform last year. Uh, at this point, it's been cited in uh, 1,300 articles uh, across 240 journals, uh, encompassing 3,300 researchers. We have a much different way of um, essentially formatting data deposits in terms of how they correlate to publications than uh, repositories like uh, Dryad, so it's the stats aren't exactly equivalent. Um, but we mint DOIs uh, and, and encourage the citation of those uh, by our authors. Um, so again, we're focused on biological data sets, so we have pretty broad taxonomic distribution, so representation of animals and animal diversity. And uh, one other aspect is uh, we have a, uh, we administered a survey last year um, assessing data sharing and archiving habits among natural science communities. It was sent to 30 list serves representing uh, dozens of disciplines uh, from anthropology to fish. Uh, and uh, we got about uh, 750 responses and the results are in press. And some interesting things that we saw, um, we asked uh, respondents um, what resources they'd used for data archiving. Um, and they were allowed to write in uh, any anything. Uh, there was no uh, options to select, uh, no, no leading. Um, so kudos to Dryad. Uh, you, uh, you were the top, top uh, mentioned repositories demonstrating the impact that, that y'all are having on the, um, the community. Um, I was pretty pleased to actually see that Morphosource was the third uh, most mentioned repository for archiving. Um, and then actually we asked the other question, where have you uh, accessed data uh, that has benefited you? Um, and uh, we see actually uh, sort of a, a, slight, a slight shift where we have more specialist repositories a little bit uh, higher up. And it makes sense that this is essentially a natural history community um, that uh, the NCBI repositories and Morphosource are maybe a bit, a bit higher here. All right, so that gets me uh, into the, the long-term operations and sustainability. Um, we're still in that, you know, I guess that uh, honeymoon period of uh, being funded by uh, grants. Um, so we've had a number of NSF grants that have um, in, in some way or another uh, uh, helped support Morphosource's uh, development. And uh, we've also uh, benefited from some private funds through uh, Duke University, uh, through uh, Harvard University. We have a partnership right now to develop some extra functionality. And uh, we also have uh, brought in some revenue uh, through licensing fees uh, to uh, private enterprise, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, possibly. So we're really just getting started here in terms of thinking of our, you know, our long-term operating costs. We're serving, I think, a pretty big community, uh, but we're a pretty small staff. And I think that we can uh, actually stay, stay that way if, if we need to. Uh, we currently have four full-time staff, including three developers and a data curator. And our current storage footprint is 65 terabytes. So that's one thing we definitely have to think about is the, is the data storage footprint, uh, because these data sets are, are fairly large. Uh, in the future, we think we can, if need be, operate with the smaller staff, uh, because we won't be actively developing uh, features all the time. Uh, but we also have to account for annual storage increases. Uh, if we project uh, 20 years into the future, um, it looks maybe something something like this. If we're adjusting for you know, raises and in inflation and that sort of thing, um, so this accounts for uh, directorship, staff, uh, data storage, and uh, costs of computers and servers. So when we start to think about uh, sustainability, uh, you know, I, I think I would I would do well to read over that Posey um, document. I think uh, Ian for sharing that and, uh, and, and Jennifer for mentioning and emphasizing it. Uh, but uh, some of the things that are clear to us is that um, NSF and other agencies can't be relied on long term. Um, uh, for our communities, access to data can't require annual or periodic payments from depositors. 
and uh, the data, uh, we have to have a way of ensuring that it can live on, even if uh, the, rep the, rep the repository itself needed to close. Uh, and so that leads us to a model where uh, we separate uh, revenue for uh, for data uh, from revenue for uh, for supporting staff and infrastructure. And what we want to do is move uh, to a, uh, a model where we have a, a data fee structure that assumes a one-time cost for long-term storage. We don't want to um, be asking uh, a researcher to pay annually uh, to support the data they've deposited. So some of the things we've done here to support that is to develop a service center and a billing model. Um, we're uh, uh, planning to uh, develop some e-commerce tools for transactions uh, uh, and that will allow data allocations. And we have a pricing model essentially based on approved uh, fiscal year storage costs from, from Duke right now. I think the question of staff and infrastructure is a bit more difficult uh, for us, or a bit more uh, complicated. Um, and and in doing uh, you know, some research, uh, we realize that there are many models, and um, and and that we have to you know based on based on various criteria decide which models uh, can be excluded. And at this stage, um, you know we uh, we know based on our need to be an an open or at least, uh, uh, if not open, at least fully, uh, freely accessible for uh, for research and education purposes, uh, we need to stay that way as a repository. So that excludes compulsory user or downloader fees. Um, and we know we're not going to be getting long-term foundation support, or at least we can't count on that. Um, so our working plan is uh, for for covering staff and infrastructure includes uh, providing certain services uh, for a fee uh, and providing certain for services for free, but requesting and encouraging support via consortium membership. And uh, for some of these plans, which I, ideas, which I won't be able to get into detail on, um, we're looking at, you know, sort of a probably five or six year runway. Um, so in terms of providing services for a fee, um, we have uh, done uh, sort of, we worked with our, um, our, uh, our licensing adventurers office to establish a protocol for licensing software um, to industry partners. The Morphosaurus stack is sort of uh, a generalized enough um, digital, digital preservation platform uh, that it can uh, potentially be customized for other kinds of uh, uh, Industry use as a as a as a private standalone instance, um, but we'd also like to envision um, an enhanced sort of value add um, contributor account, uh, where uh, you know a basic there could be a basic contributor account uh, for, as a as a free uh, as a as a as a free service uh, one, uh, but an, an enhanced level with some uh, with some annual cost to it. In terms of a uh, sort of activating a voluntary uh, uh, consortium, um, we uh, uh, want to uh, sort of cultivate a relationship with organizations that use or uh, or benefit from the Morphosaurus repository in terms of their daily um, management of, of data. And we also want to look towards nonprofit organizations that might have an interest in running their own instances of the repository software um, and, and therefore an interest in contributing uh, to uh, the, the Morphosaurus mission. So in terms of resources that we need for success, um, well, we still need a lot uh, at, this, at this point. Uh, we're not ready to uh, switch on any of these sustainability features at this, at this moment in time. Um, some of the tools that we have developed that uh, we'll need include service center for handling storage fees and other kinds of provided services. We have that in place at Duke. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, we're working on better containerizing uh, the software and, uh, and improving our deployment solutions. Um, and uh, we need to develop our e-commerce tools uh, for helping with data upload and, and enhanced contributor features in terms of planning and partnerships. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, 
it, we need to advertise the platform to private enterprise if we want to go that route. I don't, I don't know how beneficial that's ultimately going to be in the end, but it's one option that we're sort of pursuing. Um, but a more, a more important thing, uh, <clears throat> more critically, we need to identify partnerships promoting recruitment of the consortium um, or enabling uh, services to the private sector. And um, with that, I will close. I don't think I got it.